OK, here we go. Good afternoon. Who wants to learn how to fossil hunt? Uh, Brittany is going to let us know today how you can fossil hunt. Thanks for joining us for our very last segment um, of our first day of our Girl Scouts Love State Parks Weekend Celebration. This is our fifth segment and it's been so fun having the Girl Scouts from all over the country join us today, so thank you. Um, I'm Alyssa Yaple. As I mentioned, Brittany, she's going to be doing a presentation soon about fossil hunting and I have Chuck with me and Chuck is going to be help helping me answer questions. So before we get started today, I just want to say hello to some of the girls that have already writ written in, letting us know their name and location. Um, if you want to type your name and location in, we're going to try and give you a shout out if we can. But thank you, Olivia. She is a brownie um, with us today. We have um, Liliana. She is from Perry Local, Ohio. Hello. Ruth and Rebecca from Lima, Ohio. Chloe from Wisconsin and Madeline. Hello, welcome. We have Lyra from Shaker Heights. That's here in Ohio. She is a Girl Scout junior. Hi, Lyra. Um, let's see, Chloe and Ella from South Florida. Welcome. I think you might have been in one of our other segments too, so welcome back. Um, we have Quinn and Kendra. They are from North Canton. Um, Casey is a leader and her husband Kevin's a volunteer, so we have a whole family of Girl Scouts there. Um, Leah from Canton, Ohio, Mayana and Amaya from Portland, Oregon, um, Olive from Long Beach, Sophie, or excuse me, Sophia from Pennsylvania, and um, let's see, gosh, there's so many more. I'm not going to be able to read them all now, but Zalfia, she's a Daisy in Texas and Maddie from Long Island. I'm gonna have to stop there because I don't want to waste uh, you know, too much time um, right now on that. I will come back and give more shout outs later, but let me send it to Brittany to get started. All right. Hi everybody, um, my name is Brittany Perrick. I am a geologist with the Ohio Department of Natural Resources Division of Geological Survey, um, and I'm going to walk you through how to fossil hunt in Ohio. So, Based on just the start, it sounds like we have a lot of people that aren't from Ohio, so some of this will not apply to you. Um, basically, the locations that I'm going to share with everybody, but later on I'll talk about what you should bring when you're fossil hunting and what to do with your fossils when you get home, and that is applicable to everybody. Um, so hopefully you guys enjoy it regardless. And let me get my PowerPoint going. Uh, let's see. There. Can you see me or see it? Um, yes, it is coming live in just a second. You're good. OK, fantastic. Um, so to start us out, I'm going to kind of orient us in geologic time. So I have here a geologic time scale, and this is a lot to look at, I know. Um, so the cool thing is that I'm only going to talk about the third column, which is the Paleozoic, and that is what Ohio's geology is, you know, occurred during. So to kind of pull that out and simplify it a little bit, we're just going to worry about the periods. Um, so we're going to work our way from the Ordovician um, all the way up through the Permian. So the Ordovician is our oldest bedrock and then the Permian is our youngest. So here we have uh, the bedrock map of Ohio geology. Um, and as I said earlier, Ordovician down in the southwest corner, the pinks, um, that is our oldest. And then up to the Permian is our youngest. So to start us off in the Ordovician, um, that was 488 million to 443 million years ago, a long time ago. And back then, Ohio was 20 degrees below the equator, warm, shallow seas, lovely beaches, a little bit like the Bahamas are today. Um, so would have been pretty nice to live back then if you were a sea creature. Um, and because of this environment, it produced a lot of limestones and shales, which are very good for different fossils to be found in. Um, so down in this area, Probably the most fossiliferous uh, portion of the state. We're very well known for it. Um, we have bryozoans, brachiopods, cephalopods, trilobites, corals, and so much more. Um, so I say these creatures, but it helps to give you a visual to know what to look for when you're going out. So here we have a brachiopod, um, then a bryozoan, which is a kind of colonial filter feeder. So they'll be in larger chunks or kind of 
uh, broken out like this. Um, and then we have a cephalopod, um, which is kind of like an ammonoid or the modern day Nautilus. Um, they have these different chambers that help them float through the seawater. Um, and then probably our most well-known fossil for Ohio is the trilobite. Um, Isotelus is our state fossil, um, which is a trilobite. So we have a picture of the rolled versions and then the unrolled versions. So you can find both of these in this area. Moving along to the Silurian, which was 433 to 416 million years ago. Um, we're still kind of in the same location, 20 degrees below the equator, still very nice warm shallow seas. Um, in this area or in this period, we did have um, different uh, moments of you know dry land and then back to the sea. So because of this, there was some erosion, unfortunately, um, but the fossils in that time period are all going to be very similar. Um, so this also produced the limestones, the dolomites, um, shales, and then some evaporates up in the northern part of Ohio. So for this, we have tons of coral reefs. Uh, as you can see, we've got, you know, the trilobite down in the corner, some different corals, the big brain looking things that were stromatoporoids, um, the kind of wavy guys that look like sea anemones are crinoids, um, and then we have bivalves, and brachiopods, lots of different similar things, very cool fossils, my favorite time period personally. Up next, we have the Devonian, which is really neat for a bunch of different reasons. So that was 416 to 359 million years ago. Um, we've moved a little bit closer to the equator. Uh, so in this time period, uh, we had more periods of dry land um, and then the oceans that exist in Ohio became cut off. So they turned into these stagnant um, anoxic seas, very dark. Um, so it produced a lot of shale. Uh, so we have the Ohio shale in this area that um, is a very thick unit, um, stretches from the northern part of the state down even to the southern, and in it you can find, and in the limestones as well, coral reefs again, um, bryozoans, brachiopods, trilobites, cephalopods, and then we start getting into some neat stuff. We have sharks and bony fishes that start you know, being found here. So in the Ohio shale, we are able to, if, if you've seen it before, you see these big concretions, um, and they're kind of, they can be big and they can be small, but inside these concretions, we found pieces of this fish called Dunkleosteus. Uh, so it was a giant armored fish. It had armor plates on its eyes and its jaw has been found inside some of these concretions. And it kind of worked like scissors in the way that it would cut and eat things. Very big predator at the time, super cool. Um, and then we also had some of the sharks coming out. So we have Cladoceleci. Um, this is a fossilized remain of the shark, not as big as Dunkleosteus, um, but Still pretty cool, and I'll show you some shark teeth I found of that later. Moving right along, we have the Mississippian, which was 359 to 318 million years ago. Again, still near the equator, um, and we're starting to move more towards a, a terrestrial a land environment, away from the seas that we've seen in the Ordovician, Silurian, and kind of through the Devonian. Um, so because of this, there's been a bunch, um, a lot of sips, more of these organic muds and kind of just dark gunky stuff um, and then also some river and delta deposits so because of this it produces a lot of um, sandstones siltstones and shales um, sometimes we would get limestones but not nearly as prevalent as the previous periods um, still in this one you can still find brachiopods clams crinoids fish and then we're starting to get more into the land plants um, and i want to say when i said crinoids earlier they look like this um, the cool thing about this to tell a little story from my past. Um, I got my start fossil hunting very young and I didn't even realize it. So when I was a kid in elementary school, I would hang out, you know, on the playground and we would have gravel just everywhere. So what's a girl to do besides hang upside down from the monkey bars and sift through the gravel and start looking, you know, see what you can look at. Um, and that we would find these little beads. That's what we thought, they thought they were little beads. Um, turns out I had this eureka moment in college when I took an introductory geolo uh, geology class that these are actually crinoid stems. So they look so much like beads, but they were actually fossils. And I had been fossil hunting since elementary school and I didn't even realize it. So that's what's neat is that you can go out in any gravel and find some stuff, as long as it's, you know, the proper rock. Usually it's limestone, um, so you might not even have to go anywhere special to go hunting for fossils. Up next, we have the Pennsylvanian, um, 318, 299 million years ago. Again, still near the equator, and now we're kind of in a, a flat coastal swamp area. Um, the sea level is rising and falling, um, but still we're getting a lot of sandstones, um, conglomerates, 
um, shales, clay, coal, flint. The cool thing about the Pennsylvania and then the upcoming Permian is very big coal production. And if anybody's been down in the Hocking Hills region, the rocks in that area are the Pennsylvania as well, like the conglomerates and the sandstones. Um, so for this area, you're getting uh, more land plants, which is super neat, um, amphibians, reptiles, and you can still find crinoids and brachiopods, um, but other things are starting to dominate and fall away from you know, the oceans to the land. So if we zoom in here, and another cool thing about the Pennsylvania um, is that it was a, a much more oxygen-rich atmosphere. So because of that, the things that lived during that time could get a bit bigger than we see them today. So if you can see in this picture, there's a little dragonfly here, except it's not that little. Uh, back then, dragonflies would have had about a two-foot span, big span, pretty large. And then also we would have some millipedes that are like three feet long. You can ride those babies to school if you wanted to. Um, but the, uh, the plants then, it, everything was just a little bit larger than we have now because of that oxygen-rich atmosphere. So moving to our last uh, bedrock exposed at the surface in Ohio, this is the Permian, um, which was 299 to 251 million years ago. Uh, this one was about five, during this time period, we were about five degrees uh, north of the equator. Uh, again, still the kind of the coastal swamp and then getting more delta sands and by rivers and mud and everything like that. So we've moved almost entirely away from the oceans that happened during the Ordovician and the Silurian. Um, because of this, we're continuing the, the pattern of sandstones and shales, some freshwater limestone, which is pretty neat, and then again, more coal. Um, and because of this, the Permian doesn't have too many fossils compared to the western side of the state. Um, some freshwater and land fossils, um, we have found different, period, uh, different bits of this creature called Dimetrodon, which you can see here in the picture. Um, and Dimetrodon, we found bones and teeth, and the cool thing about it is it's actually more closely related to mammals than reptiles. Um, so that was a, a neat little thing that we had here. And if anyone is thinking to themselves, why are there no dinosaurs in Ohio? If you remember back to that ge geologic time scale, dinosaurs happened in the Mesozoic. That was millions of years after the um, geology that we have in Ohio. So we could have had them here, but there's no evidence. Um, it, it wasn't a very deposition heavy environment, um, so there's no preservation here for those. Unfortunate. Um, so now that I have oriented you guys in geologic time and you know what the bedrock is looking for and where you kind of want to go, like what part of the area, what uh, areas of the state, what rocks interest you the most, I'm going to walk you through some public collecting sites that we have in Ohio. So it might be that you have a creek on your property that you can go out and look at at any time. That's awesome. But some people, I live in the city. I don't, I don't really have a lot of really cool rocks in my backyard. So there are these different parts of the state and different parks that you can go to and collect for free, for public. Um, so let's start us out um, in the northwest portion of the state in Lucas County. This is Fossil Park in Sylvania, Ohio. Um, super neat park. Um, it used to be a quarry and they kind of taken all the the mine things and dump them for people to look at. Um, this is the Devonian Age silica formation, so you will find trilobites, brachiopods, corals, other things. Those are kind of the, the big three there. Um, the thing about this park is that you need to make a reservation um, because of coronavirus. Uh, they're open Friday, Saturday, and Sunday, but you can go online and make a reservation. They have different time slots you can select, um, so you can, be, you can be like, I only want to be there for two hours, and that's totally fine, or if you want to spend the whole day there. Also a very great idea. Um, another thing about this area is they do not allow tools, um, but the good thing about the geology is that you should be able to break it apart and pick things out no problem with your hands. Um, and that just helps preserve the, you know, the rock for other people to look at. Because if you have tools, it's kind of a leg up, but no tools for anybody. Moving south, we have Oaks Quarry Park in Fairborn, Ohio, which is Silurian Age Brassfield Limestone. So in this one, you're going to find a lot of crinoids. Um, a lot of beads, um, corals, brachiopods, stromatoporoids, which I'll show you one later. I have a very cool specimen of it, um, and bryozoans again. The super cool thing about this park in particular is that it also shows evidence of past glaciations. Um, so in the floor of the quarry, um, in the bedrock there, you can see what we call glacial striations. And it's it's like grooves. It's like the, the glacial grooves um, up at Kelly's Island, but smaller scale. Um, so what happened is back when the glaciers were moving into Ohio and retreating, um, think about it kind of like a lint roller. It would pick up all this debris, you know, trees and rocks and other chunks of things, 
And then as it moved down along Ohio, it kind of scraped across the surface. Um, and the evidence of that scraping are the striations. Uh, so that's pretty neat there too. And then the park has tons of good signage um, and trails and everything that can help anybody understand what's been going on there. Um, and then for this area, um, they have designated piles that you can collect from, um, but they're marked as you can see in the picture. So they collect from this pile only. Um, so very easy to see and you'll find lots of cool things there. Next is Houston Wood State Park, all the way on the western side of the state. Um, it's near Miami University in College Corner, Ohio. Um, and this is Ordovician age shales and limestones. So in this area, most fossiliferous units in the state, um, you're gonna find brachiopods, what I like to call trilobits, um, corals and trace fossils. And trace fossils are kind of evidence of past life. Um, so that'll include burrows, uh, tracks, feeding tubes, just anything where you can tell something lived there but the thing, the something isn't preserved, just the fact that it was there. Um, and in Houston Woods, it's mostly stream collecting, uh, but always make sure you check with the naturalist. I know with coronavirus, they would need some time, or before coronavirus, they would lead um, fossil hunting before, um, but just make sure everything's still okay to go out and do that. Um, but it's a really neat park if you go anyway. Looking in the streams, tons of fossils, it's very cool. And then earlier when I said trilobits, I want you to understand that's kind of a colloquial term. Um, I like to call them that because it's not the whole trilobite, it's kind of a, a bit of trilobite. Um, so as you can see here circled, I have parts of the cephalon, which is the head region. Um, so there's a trilobit of cephalon and a more trilobit of cephalon there. Um, up next is probably the most well-known place in Ohio to go fossil hunting, which is Caesar Creek State Park down in Waynesville. This is again the Ordovician age of uh, shale and limestone. And here you will find some very excellent trilobites. Um, the pictures that I showed earlier, the starting slide, that was trilobites that you can find at Caesar Creek, um, more brachiopods, cephalopods, corals, and more. Um, the thing about this is that the collecting spot is in the emergency spillway of the dam. Um, so because of this, you have to go to the Army Corps of Engineers, um, which manages that area and get a permit from them. Um, you can do that at the visitor center. I don't know if they're doing if the visitor center is open quite yet, um, but I know if you call ahead, they'll tell you exactly what you need to know and where you need to go. Um, and the permit is free. They just want to keep track of who's where when you go down there. Um, and like uh, Fossil Park in Sylvania, this area is also tools prohibited. But again, you should have no problem finding anything. Some of these rolled trilobites are just out laying around just because they've popped out because of weathering. Um, people have accidentally kicked a rock and it had fallen out as well. So it's very easy to find different fossils in this area. And last but certainly not least, we have Trammell Fossil Park, which is down in Sharonville, Ohio in Cincinnati. Um, again, Ordovician age shells and limestones. Um, you'll find brachiopods, trilobites, corals, bryozoans, gastropods, which are kind of like ancient snails. They have that same snail shell looking look to them um, and then more. And the cool thing about this area is you can just show up, park, and get to hunting. Uh, there's no permit required. Uh, this the hillside that you start looking at, and as you can see in the picture, there's tons of good um, signage to help you understand the park, um, its inception, the fossils, the rocks that you're looking at. A very cool place to look at. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, and so I had mentioned earlier that I have some of my personal favorite specimens to look at. So I'm gonna show you guys some pictures of them because it's easier to see them on the screen and then I'll hold them up so you can kind of get a feel for what they actually look like. So I mentioned um, the Devonian shark, Cladoceleci, and here I have found a, a, an arrangement of teeth. So as you can see, this is, and it's, it's hard to picture when you think about eight millimeters, it's not as easy to picture as when you could see it in person. Very, very small teeth. And it's an assemblage of just a whole bunch of them also. So that one's only eight millimeters, and this next one is even smaller at two. And then we have a little bit of, I think it was a, a jawbone, but I know my coworker Mark is going to tell me that was incorrect, but I can't remember what he said. Um, so it was really neat to find that. And the cool thing about that is I found this in Ross County um, along Paint Creek. And down in that area, it's near Copperas Mountain, which is a amazing exposure of the Ohio shale. And the cool thing about that, so I know I'm in an environment that is mostly shale. And the thing that drew me to this rock is the fact that it looked like limestone. That's a little strange because I should just be seeing shale here. 
And I know in the Ohio Shale, there are little lenses of limestone available. So if that's a little different, I'm going to want to pick that up. And the cool thing about that, too, is that so you see how that the, the teeth and the remains are a darker color. They're like almost black. Um, that also piqued my interest because that is something that stands out. I mean, fossil hunting is really a lot about pattern recognition to me. Um, so once you know what you're looking for, once you see pictures of what the fossils should look like, the fossils, not the creature, because over millions of years, they're going to end up looking a little bit different than what they, what the artist's rendition think they would look like. Um, so once you get in your head what you're looking for, and you keep going out, and you keep looking, you keep picking up things, and you keep seeing, it's, it's a lot easier to keep recognizing this in the wild. Um, so the cool thing is that that dark color, immediately I wanted to pick that rock up because it was different from the limestone and because it had these flecks of black in it. And then this fossil here is my pride and joy. Anyone that knows me knows that this is my favorite beyond all doubt, <laughs> is a stromatoporoid, which is a fossilized sea sponge now. Um, and the cool thing about this, I mean, what you may be thinking is, Bernie, that looks a lot like a tree. It does, but it grew similarly, the trees, and as time would pass, it would grow in these layers, like the rings of a tree, to show, you know, time has been passing for this guy. And the cool thing about this, I pulled this out of a ditch in Highland County, and this is only half of it. So in person, when I show you it, you'll see that it's a big ball. So overall, when I saw it, it took this big bulbous it, the object that I was like, this is pretty neat. And when I picked it up, it didn't look, I couldn't see the inside of it. So I just took a chance on picking it up and seeing what it looked like. Very super cool. And then since that one looks like a tree but isn't a tree, how about I show you guys a tree that is a tree? So this is petrified wood. And I didn't even realize that Ohio had petrified wood until I started my job with their survey. So I grabbed this um, in a stream in Athens County. Uh, so we're back on the east side of the state. Um, most of my things were kind of found in the southwest, um, but this is east side, Athens County. Um, very neat, petrified wood. And so you, if you could tell me, switch back between the other one. So this kind of has this like, it's, you know, it's smooth looking, kind of a, a glossy, almost cloudy look to it. That's the, the silica rich, you know, thing that it has become. And that, that, that look, that texture, that feel, I, I know to recognize it as potentially something to pick up. And that's the thing with the petrified wood and the stromatoporoid, it's now um, been silicified. And so it's been replaced by, you know, quartz bearing minerals and everything, very similar to the flint. So flint will have this look to it that has um, kind of a, almost a dull luster, um, but you're drawn to it. It's just, it's just something that's a little bit different from the environment that it's found in, that'll help you look for it in the future. <coughs> Excuse me. And then last but not least, um, this guy is cool. Also, I found this near Cambridge, Ohio. It is a fossilized fern, so it's kind of an imprint. And the cool thing about this, um, and you can see like the crack that's in it, I found it by peeling apart two layers. Um, and that's one of the things that you want to do when you're out looking for different things, because a lot of times you'll see, uh, you know, things get, buried, they die, they settle, they get buried. And so there's always gonna be, you know, just these layers in between. So sometimes peeling things apart yields really cool different things. Um, so this is a Pennsylvania aged fern. Um, one of the only land plant fossils that I have, but still super cool. Um, so I think this is now the time, now that you know where to go, I'm gonna tell you what you can take with you. And this is gonna be important for everybody. This is applicable across the board. You're going out fossil hunting. What are you gonna to wanna to bring in your toolkit? Because now you're going out, you're gonna be a paleontologist while you look for this because you're looking for fossils and that is what paleontologists are all about. So I'm gonna stop sharing here. And it could be just me again. So you know where to go, but now you need to know what to bring. You can go fossil hunting, and bring nothing. That is entirely up to you. You might regret not having things to carry all the stuff that you're going to find. I mean, maybe you're going to laden down your pockets with it. I've done it before. But it's really nice to be prepared and have everything with you. Uh, so probably the most important thing going out is safety first. Um, make sure you're aware of where you're going, what the weather is going to be like. Uh, I'm a very pale person. I burn very easily. So when I go out, I like to wear 
a beautiful hat. It's a little hard to see with my background there, but this will keep me shaded very well throughout the day. It's a very large hat, so I can hide my shoulders underneath, or at least I can get some, you know, my ears in the back of my neck protected from that. And so that's really good too. Um, make sure you're wearing, you know, appropriate shoes. If you're going to be doing hiking, climbing over rocks, flip flops probably aren't the best uh, idea. I always wear boots just because it keeps my feet safe. Um, and I know that they're very secure to walk around and hike in. Um, appropriate, you know, shoes, or, sorry, shoes out and clothes, you know, long sleeves, you're going to be in sun. Um, pants, if you're going to be in foliage, you don't want to get poison ivy or ticks, depending on the type of year you're going out. Um, but then also, Big safety key here is really super cool safety glasses. Uh, so these are if you're going to areas where you are allowed to break open rocks. And so you need to keep an eye on the different locations. Make sure that you are allowed to bring with you a super cool rock hammer. This one's mine. It's broken open many a rock. Helps you. This here helps you peel and flip rocks because sometimes if you're out west, there might be super scary bugs underneath it. Uh, but this is good for all sorts of things and for hanging stuff in your house. Another safety precaution, since I mentioned sun protection with ye old hat, sunscreen also super important. I wear it all the time. And then bug spray too. Can't have too much of this. When you're out, so something that's been instilled, oh, sorry, one more safety thing. Two more safety things first aid kit. I carry one of these on me in my bag at all times. Um, I have never had to use it, but I would rather have it and not need it than need it and not have it. Um, these things, this is specifically a hiking one, but since I'm doing a lot of field work and I'm out hiking anyway, keep it on me just in case. Very important to have. And then also, when you're out looking at some of these rocks to protect your little face, gloves are a fantastic idea. Um, these are my gardening and or rock hounding gloves. They have a nice uh, leather palm and fingers. So when you're picking things up and flipping them over, you're not, you know, cracking your fingers on the edges of that. Just nice to have. Keeps you cleaner too. Makes things up super easy. All right. And then something that's been instilled in geologists from, from our geology birth is taking excellent notes. This is my notebook from field camp. <laughs> I'm losing myself in the picture. Um, and this, when we go out to an outcrop, or if you go fossil hunting, it really helps orient yourself on where you've been, what you did, what you found, who you were with, how you felt, what you ate, all kinds of stuff. And that'll help you later on to know where you were when you found X thing. Um, and we also have these little notes that will, uh, I'll show a picture of later and that we can get you a link to find some of these. It just talks about even the most basic information, just where you found it and what you think it is, is probably the most important thing. Date collected, also very important. Um, but you know, if you're trying to get it identified by somebody else, like geologists at the Ohio Geological Survey, we can help you fill in the remainder of the blanks, which are like species, genus, phylum, different things like that. And so when you're out, and you're collecting all your super cool fossils, what are you gonna put them in? Like I said, your pockets are great. I filled my pockets with fossils. I'm still finding fossils in coat pockets that I forget that I have and that I don't label and I regret. Um, so you can also, Ziploc bags, very, very easy. Um, take them with you. I have baggies on hand just from craft projects that I just always keep and hoard. Great for tiny fossils. Um, I've got kind of a, a larger brachiopod in here that's a little hard to make out. Um, another thing for really small fossils is an old Tic Tac box. I have a bunch of tiny little crinoid stems in here, a little beads, um, and those I found out in the Highland County, so this is good to keep track of them. And another thing that's really good uh, that I've seen people use is egg cartons. Um, that's, you know, especially for younger kids, it's easy for them to hold on to and fill with rocks and then it just kind of keeps it all organized and intact and it's not too heavy or burdensome for some of them. Um, but you're also going to want to have Sharpie or a pen on hand to label your bags or your carton or your box. Um, if you're not taking notes entirely, at least label something. It's very useful. Uh, another thing super important that you all just love to have on hand is, as you saw with the uh, 
Oh, I didn't show my fossils. I'll do that in a second. Um, <laughs> the shark teeth, eight millimeters, two millimeters, very small. Uh, it's good to have magnification on hand. This is uh, a magnifying glass or a jeweler's loop. Um, you can get them, I think I saw you can get them like online at Lowe's or Home Depot, other things like that. And it just, you hold it up to your eye and you're able to look at the magnification with something much smaller than the, your eye can make out. So this is really good for that finer detail. And it's just cool to get down in there and see, you know, just a, a little bit more than you would at the naked eye. So we have these on hand, kept it around my neck for many a trip. So it's always right there. And then while you're out, uh, you're looking at your fossils. They're kind of, you know, rocks are going to be dirty, covered in mud, silt, soil. Good to have a little toothbrush on hand. You can be down in there, kind of clean it off. Also very, very good for when you get home to clean your rocks because you're going to want to do that. Very good stuff. And then I would say last, but, oh, I always forget this, guys. Very important to have lots of water on hand. Just please bring water with you. I need water right now. But again, this is the, all right, and this is the bag <laughs> that I take with me uh, to put all of my rocks and stuff in, carry all of my things. There we go, let's do that. All right, yeah, so this is my field bag. It's got lots of pockets, nice uh, straps for the hips, take the weight off the shoulders. I, I weigh this thing down with snacks and water and rocks that I find. Very useful, you can take any bag you want out. I've gone fossil hunting, fanny packs, um, you know, satchel type thing. I see people bring buckets out. It's all about what you want to carry and how you want to carry it, which is the most important stuff. All right, now that I've shown you guys my super cool toolkit, I did say I was going to show you my rocks, which I forgot for a second, but I remembered again. So I will show you my shark teeth. A little hard to see, which is why I showed you that close-up picture because this is how tiny these are like barely a fingernail size of shark teeth and the other goofy thing about this is that we're pretty sure uh, and a couple geologists you know helped me figure this out uh, most likely this cladocelachy was eaten by something and then digested and then its remains were passed and this uh, deposit, which we call coprolite, um, the, the feces was then lithified and left in this nice little blob for us to find, which is kind of neat. And then I will show you my stromatoporoid, which is very large and requires two hands for me. This guy, super, super cool. Um, and the thing that drew me to it from the outside, aside from it being a ball shape, were these different lines that you can see here, kind of like the rings of a tree. And I knew it was going to be a stromatoporoid, but I didn't know what it was going to look like on the inside. And that's the neat thing about fossil hunting is it's not going to hurt you to pick up a rock. If it looks cool, pick it up. If it's nothing, put it back. Pretty easy. And it can see outside. And this thing's so heavy. Oh my goodness. Okay. And then my petrified wood here looks like an actual branch. Very neat. Kind of the same delicious luster as the stromatoporoid here. Um, so, and I knew what I was looking for here. I, I went out specifically searching for petrified wood because I knew, and it was in our Minerals of Ohio book that we have, um, that this location had petrified wood. And I just knew, especially if, if there's anybody in here from Arizona, I believe that's where the petrified forest is, uh, that wood, we don't have any of the cool opalized stuff, but if you're familiar with the way it can look, um, it'll help you in finding it in the wild. And then last but not least, we'll see if I can keep it intact because as I said, I've peeled it between layers and the layers are still trying to peel, it is my fossilized fern. There's a little, little guy down here, might be hard to see. My glasses are super dirty, so it's hard for me to see anyway. Um, but yeah, this wants to come apart and I need to glue it, but yes. Well, there we go. All right. Now that you've been out, you collected all of your super cool rocks and you made your very important labels. What do you do? Uh, I mean, what, what do you do once you get home? Maybe you didn't make your labels out in the field. What do you what's what's your. What's your next step? 
So as I said, with a toothbrush, especially, clean, clean, clean your samples because they're going to make a mess of your house if you don't. And when you clean them, it helps you go through and remember where you were and what you think it is. Um, and kind of just like, and when you clean, you get a lot more detail um, coming out when you get the mud off of it and all the gunk. And some of the, some of the mud in Ohio is very clay rich, so it's super sticky and very gunky. So it helps to warm water, toothbrush. Um, I would say do not use vinegar. Vinegar is a weak acid and it will dissolve some limestones and you do not want to dissolve the fossils. Um, but depending on the, you know, the preservation of said fossils, you could dissolve some of the matrix around the fossils. Tread lightly with that one. I would say at the very least, clean them. And then here I have a picture of that label that I showed you guys earlier. Um, different information that's super important, at least the location, um, the what you think the formation might be, um, date you found it. And if you label your specimens by, oh, this is specimen one, two, and three from location four, um, that'll help you keep them in order. Um, and then on the picture on the right here, we have a drawer that's from the University of Toledo. And as you can see, a bunch of, um, and this is a pretty common practice uh, with fossil collectors and paleontologists and, you know, fossil lovers, is to take the, the lids and the bottoms of little boxes, um, put in a little label slip like the one that I have here, or people would make their own, and then put the rock on and the fossil on top of it. And that helps keep things super organized, very easy to tell, and remember, and keep it always together so you don't mess anything up. And then that makes it easier to store in drawers or display in your home. I know my house is littered with rocks. Um, and since I do most of my field work kind of in the South Central Southwest area, I know about where they've been from, but I do need to learn for myself and make my own labels. I'm getting better at it. I will get better at it. Um, and then this is applicable um, mostly to Ohio for these next ones but also to people in different states. Uh, when you're going out, if you want to know what the geology you're looking at, uh, the different types of fossils you can find, um, where you're allowed to hunt, check with your universities and your geological surveys. Um, oftentimes they are linked together. Um, different local clubs. So here I've got uh, Dry Dredgers is down in Cincinnati and they are um, a bunch of fossil collectors. They do a lot of really cool work. Um, and then local to Columbus, where I am, is the Columbus Rock and Mineral Society. So they do um, Columbus Rock and Mineral Show in April when we're not in coronavirus times. Um, but they're also very good at giving access to different locations you might not get as a, you know, private citizen. Um, with these clubs, you can sometimes get into quarries um, and different areas that with their club status, they can get more people into, which is super neat. And then also uh, with Ohio State University, there's the Orton Geological Museum, which is a super cool museum. It is closed right now. Um, but keep checking back on the page on when they're going to reopen. You can go in, see how they label things and have stuff organized and what's been found in Ohio. Way more things than I've mentioned today. Um, and then on the Geological Survey's Facebook page, we have a note that has all the information that I've listed. Um, the same map on the, diff the five different locations and information with those. Um, further reading, things if you want to learn more about the fossils, we have much more information on that. Um, an example of the label that you can then copy and print out for yourself. Uh, all that good stuff. And then also on our new website, which was launched just this past month, we have a rock identification page. Um, we do ask that you try to keep it to Ohio rocks since we are Ohio geologists, um, but you can upload pictures. Um, make sure you always include scale. We love having little rulers so we know how big the sample is. Um, where you found it, uh, just different information. We'll, it'll go to a bunch of different geologists um, here at the office and we will try to identify it for you the best that we can. Um, and then also, as you can see on the right hand of the page there, we have a uh, rock mineral and fossil species index, which right now includes some of the more common um, rocks, minerals and fossils that you can find in Ohio. Um, so you can try your hand at IDing your finds for yourself. Um, when you start getting into the different species and genuses, that's a little more difficult. That's when I go to my coworker Mark and ask him, what have I found? Because <laughs> I knew I knew I had found shark teeth. I did not know it was cladocelachy. So it's always good to ask for help and for a different ID. So you can definitely fill things out there, find more information about us and the survey and ODNR. 
um, on that website there. And that is what I have for everybody. I'm sure oh, you guys have so many questions, so please ask away. Yes, yes Brittany. Brittany. Okay. okay. Um, before we ask the questions, I want to give some shout outs. Um, and then we'll come back to some questions. We have about 10 minutes left. So I just want to say hello to Ari from Santa Clarita, California. Aubrey from Hillsboro, Ohio. I think that Brittany, you said you found one of the fossils you showed, or you showed us was from Highland County. So yes. Aubrey, you can find some fossils near Hill Hillsboro. Um, mm -hmm. We have Aurora in central Indiana, Amelia and Sophia in Tempe, Arizona, SD Northeast Texas, and she is also a member of the Dallas Paleontolog I can't say this Paleontological Society. Did I say that right? Yep. <laughs> Um, we have Adele in Germantown, Tennessee, Alyssa in Northeast Ohio. Hey, my name's Alyssa and I grew up in Northeast Ohio. Um, Olivia from Claremont County, Ohio, Ember from Canton, Augie from Michigan, Amelia, she's from Troop 5056, Olivia in Virginia, and we also have Lily from Virginia, um, and Lisa from Virginia. Mara, North Carolina, Audrey, Littleton, Colorado, Gwen from Lancaster, Ohio, hello. Um, and we have Delilah from California. She is a daisy and wants to be a paleontologist. Um, Naomi from Maryland, maybe from Michigan. Three more, Gwendolyn from Washington, Washington State, Abigail, hello from South Florida, and Mia and Melissa from Geauga County, Ohio. Thank you all so much for joining us. Um, so now to questions, and we have quite a few, so we're going to have to go through these kind of quickly, Brittany. Um, I did answer them too. <laughs> <laughs> um, so let's see. We had uh, Zofia wrote in, and, and she said, how do you tell the difference from rocks and fossils? So fossils are rocks, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Yep. So the main difference there, like I said earlier, pattern recognition um, and making sure that where you're looking for fo or for fossils, the rocks actually have fossils. Um, and the the tricky thing is there are some different formations and structures that look like they should be fossils but aren't. Um, and that's one of those things that's tricky that um, you won't know until really you ask somebody or try to identify yourself. Um, so you can send things in uh, and we can try our best there. Okay, and we have a question. Let's see. Um, Haley, she's a brownie from Central Ohio. Hello, Haley. Uh, she won. She says she's really enjoyed all of the segments today. That's so kind of you. And she wants to know if there's any dinosaur fossils that have been discovered in Central Ohio. Did we have dinosaur fossils? Unfortunately, not. Um, all of the rocks in Ohio are millions and millions of years older than what the dinosaurs would be found in. Um, so, uh, nothing here. Uh, there might have been dinosaurs, but we have no evidence of it. Uh, there was no rock deposition during that time for us. So, you got to go a little west. <laughs> dinosaurs. And Zofia also asked. Um, what is the rarest fossil? And I've heard Mark, our paleontologist, say that the rarest fossil has, is one that's yet to be found. Do you agree, Brittany? Definitely, yeah. I mean, <laughs> we haven't found everything by any means. We've, we barely scratched the surface. Um, so that's why we need people to get out and start looking. Find okay. crazy new things. Um, so does how close you are to uh, sea level determine the amount or types of fossils you can find? Um, at the time, so right now we're not that close to sea level, um, at least not compared to South Florida. Um, but since, you know, during the Ordovician, Silurian, and parts of Devonian, we were, we were an ocean. Um, so during the time of these rocks being depositing, it depends on the environment. So if it's an ocean, you may find tons of fossils. And it also depends on if there's been erosion since these you know, layers were deposited. It's, it's a very complex story that we have for all the geology of Earth. Um, but your current uh, sea level position doesn't necessarily um, depend on what you can find. 
Okay, and I have uh, one of our returning guests who I, I forgot to give a shout out, so I apologize. Fossil Fan. He has been with us for many segments, so thank you, Fossil Fan, for coming back. Um, we have Aurora who wants to know what got you into fossil hunting. You touched on it a little bit, Brittany. You kind of, so, um, and and somebody had asked how you got into teaching, but this isn't your full time job, right? No, not entirely. So I'll answer it kind of. I got into geology because as a kid, my eyes were always glued to the ground looking at rocks. I mean, I did. I was always looking for rocks, like on the uh, the playground, finding you know the little crinoid stem beads in the gravel. Um, it was just always super neat. You know, you're driving along the road and there's a rock outcrop. You're like, wow, what does that mean? And it wasn't until I, I was very fortunate to go on a vacation to Hawaii um, before I started college. And I loved volcanoes as a kid. So I was naming all these different things. And I'm like, I think I still like geology. I'm probably going to take some geology courses. And then that got me into geology. And then the paleontology, the fossil hunting, it's just cool. It's neat to go out and find things that maybe no one else has no one else has seen for millions and millions of years uh and just add to the collection and there's some neat things and learning about the different life forms i just like doing it it's fun now maddie asked how deep would the fossils be in the ground and you just mentioned you can find fossils in gravel so really you don't even have to dig at all right mm -hmm. sometimes you don't and it i mean it depends on the layers so uh, that first bedrock map of Ohio I showed, you know, the Ordovician is still in Ohio. It's just buried underneath all of the other sediments in the eastern, you know, the, the Pennsylvania and the Permian stuff. Um, so there's probably, I mean, and we have um, different core, which is where you drill down through the bedrock that you can see fossils in pulled up from thousands of feet beneath the surface. Um, so there are fossils down there, um, but we can't get down there. Um, <laughs> and then we have found tracks in mines. Uh, so we have tetrapod tracks, which were like little reptile things um, in a coal mine. So you have to go deep sometimes, but you can definitely still find stuff at the surface. Um, somebody wants to know, have you ever found gemstones when you've been fossil hunting? Gemstones. Um, well, see, the cool thing about uh, different minerals and gems in Ohio is that we have not super duper rare ones, but we have stuff, you know, Quartz can look really neat, and you have chalcedony, which is a form of, you know, cryptocrystalline quartz, um, calcite that you can find um, in this sample that I didn't show earlier. I believe this is going to be quartz or calcite crystals in a cephalopod. Um, so I haven't found, I found like little pyrite nodules. Um, I haven't found anything, I guess, that you would deem super worth a bunch of money. Um, but you can still find minerals out there. Um, nothing of gemstones because you have to take the mineral and then you know polish and cut it and make it into the gem. Um, but mm -hmm. there's tons of really neat minerals in Ohio that you can find out more about on our website. Okay, we have Bran and she asked, um, what is the formation field for? So I think this is in reference to the display that you talked about. Yeah, so the formation is the unit of bedrock within a geologic period. So I talked about the Silurian, right? Um, in there, we have the Brassfield limestone, which would be the, the formation that you found the rock or the fossil in, that you think. And it can depend, because some things we know what formation they are based on the fossils that they have. So if you say, oh, I think I found this in the Brassfield, I'd be like, no, this looks a lot more like the Cope formation in Cincinnati. Um, so it's just a, a way that geologists use to kind of orient ourselves in geologic time. Um, okay, uh, Aurora asks, what is a mastodon? And I can't tell entirely what's behind you there. Is that a mastodon? Yeah. And, and Chuck <laughs> answered it in, in the, um, it, well, actually, I don't know if that if we published it. So could you touch on that, Brittany? Yeah, Mastodon. So what I didn't really talk about was the Quaternary, like the Ice Age of Ohio. Um, and that's when we had the Mastodons. And I think this is the beaver down here. Um, where we had different animals that lived during the Ice Age. And a Mastodon was 
if you've seen the movie Ice Age, um, I think uh, Manny's actually a mammoth, um, but we both existed and there are differences between the two. So it's kind of just a, a, an ancient mammal, um, now extinct, that you can find in Ohio. Um, they're pretty hard to find, which is why I didn't mention them. And it involves like actually digging, usually in uh, bogs. So we find them a lot of times. Um, so it can happen, but you're probably not going to find something like that. I haven't. <laughs> <laughs> um, Brittany, we have we have just maybe one more minute uh, or two left. Mm -hmm. We we could go a little bit over since this is our last segment of the day. But um, Lyra from Shaker Heights, she is very curious if you play Animal Crossing and look for fossils in the game. I do play Animal Crossing, and I did find all the fossils, and I completed that collection for bladders. Um, I'm still working on fish and bugs and sea creatures and art, though. But yes, I, I love the fossil hunting part of Animal Crossing. <laughs> <laughs> um, Casey is wondering what the most common fossil is that you can find. Most common? <sighs> Depends on the period. Um, the one I see the most of is probably the brachiopods or crinoids. Um, they just they have an amazing reach within Ohio, and I'm sh it, it will definitely change if you look at geology as a whole. I do not know the most prevalent uh, fossil, but you're going to find a lot of the same ones depending on the age. Okay, and a couple more questions. Um, this is a this might be a difficult one. Paige asked, what is the largest fossil found? So since we're talking about Ohio fossils, mm -hmm. um, we might want to keep it to Ohio. Okay. Would that be the Dunkley osseus, or is, are there larger ones? Um, the largest would probably be just the different ma uh, mammoth pieces. Um, or, mm. but as far as like fossils found within the rocks, um, Dunkley osseus bits probably make up the, one of the largest creatures because Dunkley osseus was massive. Um, the the fish jaw was like over a foot long. Um, but largest in general would be mammoth pieces, most likely. Okay, um, and have you found arrowheads? <laughs> Aria is asking. I personally haven't, but I know many of my coworkers that have, um, they have land. Like one of my coworkers, Frank, he has land down in Lancaster. Um, and when it gets tilled properly, like the old tiny till, um, you can unearth different things there. Um, so yeah, they, they are still out there. You just gotta find the right environment for them. Okay, and um, just a couple more questions, and then we're going to wrap up. Fossil Fan asks, can you find fossils in forests? I think so, but Brittany? Fossils in forests? Yeah. Absolutely, as long as there's rock exposed. Um, okay. that's, that's the main key. So you can still have forests with rocks in it. Um, there's some forests with sinkholes that have rocks in them that I've seen fossils in. Uh, so it just depends on where you are and what is exposed. Now, Mackenzie, she's a cadet from Baltimore County, um, and she is wondering if you have found any interesting fossils outside of Ohio. Outside of Ohio, yes. Um, so for geology, you have to take a field mapping course, and we did ours in Wyoming and Montana, and I found um, dinosaur tracks, which I did not keep because I couldn't, and I wanted to leave it there for everybody else to see. And then also these things called gastroliths, which if you know, dinosaurs are basically ancestors of birds um, and specifically chickens. They have these stones in their stomach that help them digest different things. And dinosaurs had the same stuff. So I've found dinosaur stomach rocks, basically, which is what gastrolith means, is stomach rock. Um, so that would have helped them digest their food at the time. Not quite as fossil, not a true fossil, but from an ancient creature. Okay, I said that was the last one, but I do have just two more. <laughs> um, Casey wants to know if you can find, if, if you found diamonds, and I'm I'm going to guess that you haven't found diamonds. That would be pretty cool, and you'd probably be bragging to us. Yeah, I probably would be. <laughs> I haven't personally found any diamonds. Um, we do have some diamonds in Ohio, but they are not naturally occurring. They, um, can be found here because when the glaciers came down from Canada, and that's where a lot of diamonds can be found up in the Kimberlites in Canada, they were brought down with the glaciers. So they are here, very hard to find, similar to gold. It's it's gonna be a, 
a nonstop search and it would just be probably not for much monetary gain. Okay. Um, and okay, this, I promise that this is the last one. <laughs> Aurora asks, um, have you ever gone out of your, out, out of your state? So this is kind of similar to two questions ago, but have you found dinosaur fossils? And if you haven't, maybe give some advice. Can other people find dinosaur fossils in the United States outside of Ohio? Yeah, so I haven't personally gone out with the intent to look for dinosaur fossils, but in Montana and Wyoming, where I did my field mapping course, there were other groups there from different paleon paleontology departments out looking for dinosaurs specifically, and they have found them. Um, so again, it depends on uh, what land you're on, checking with you know, universities, clubs, um, different groups, making sure, you, and they will take you to places that you can look for these. Um, out West has tons more dinosaur fossils than here where we have none um so you can find some pretty great stuff like the t-rex sue that's in the chicago museum of natural history was found in south dakota um so it's just a matter of knowing where to look all right well thank you so much Brittany. Mm -hmm. um thanks chuck who has been behind the scenes and helping me answer these questions um and thanks to our viewers. It's been so great having you today. And we hope that you will continue with us tomorrow for our um, second day celebration of Girl Scouts Love State Parks. Bye-bye. Awesome, bye.